around 1642-43. Penelope Van Prince, a widow of 23, was a noble woman who had passed through many struggles, nearing death several times during her efforts to reach America. The ship which was bringing Penelope and her husband wrecked off Sandy Hood, New Jersey. Her husband had been quite ill during the voyage and was seriously injured in the attempt to reach land. The ship's passengers feared an attack by Indians, so they decided to travel immediately to Amsterdam. Penelope's husband was in no condition to travel, so they were left behind. Soon after the crew and passengers were out of sight, a group of Iroquois hunters who had probably watched the shipwreck slipped out of the woods and attacked the defenseless pair. They killed the husband first, then turned on Penelope, cutting and wounding her until she felt bleeding and senseless. As Penelope surmised, they had built a fire and cooked a meal. When they finished eating, they departed, believing both victims to be dead. But somehow Penelope did not die. She was young and healthy, her soul was hardy, her pioneer spirit did not give up. Inside the hollow tree, she fell into an exhausted sleep. When she awoke, she was shivering. Night had fallen. Penelope left her makeshift tree home, made her way back to the fire on the beach, found a few coals, and built up the fire to warm herself. And, of course, she prayed that the perpetrators would not return. They did not. The smoke from the fire also helped keep the insects away from her wounds. She kept the fire going all night long, and at the first sign of dawn, crept once again into the relative safety of her hollow tree. One morning, nearly famished from lack of food, she left the tree to look for something to eat. A young deer with two arrows protruding from its side stumbled into her path, followed by two tall Indians. They were as surprised to see a mutilated white woman as Penelope was to see them. Fearing that her life was over, she fell on her knees and collapsed. However, as the Indian caught the wounded deer and put it out of its misery, they argued over what to do with the wounded woman. The young Indian thought she should be finished off like the deer. The older Indian, who took pity on her, said he would take her home with him. He picked Penelope up, slung her over his shoulder, and set out for his village. The young Indian picked up the deer, slung it around his neck and followed. The two Indians were Delawares from the village of Chakasit, about four miles inland. He carried Penelope to his wigwam and gave orders to his squaws to care for her. The Indian women gave her food and water, bathed her and patched her up her wounds with spiderwebs, mud and various herbal remedies, sewing the deepest gashes together with fishbone needles and vegetable fibers. Slowly, Penelope recovered her health and strength. Her savers showed her how to cook a tasty combination of corn and beans, which they called stukatash, and they taught her how to fish for bass, grouper and shad, dig for clams and prepare venison by alternately freezing and thawing the meat until it became tender. By the time spring arrived, she had learned enough of the Delaware tongue to communicate with her new friends. Penelope became, in effect, an adopted daughter. Life was not bad, considering how close she had come to death. She fashioned a headpiece to cover the mangled skin of her scalp. Her left arm hung useless at her side, and the vicious wounds on her abdomen healed but left unsightly growths of scar tissue that stuck out about an inch in a large X pattern. When she regained her enough strength, her old Indian benefactor encouraged her to join the other women at their chores, pounding corn, cooking food, skinning and tanning, carrying burdens, tending fires, and looking after each other's babies. Penelope did not even consider trying to run away, for in that wild country, where could she go that was safer than the village of Chakasi? Furthermore, the Indians all treated her more like a friend than a prisoner. Since members of the village traded up and down the coast, word finally reached New Amsterdam that a white woman was living in this particular Indian camp. Her fellow shipwreck passengers in Gravesend, guessing it might be Penelope, crossed the bay and went to investigate. Arriving at Chakasi, they asserted that it was she and that she was alive and well. They demanded her release. The old Indian went to her wigwam and put the question to her, confident that she would prefer to remain with him and the other Indians. He explained that the man had come for her, but that he was leaving the decision to her. He said to her in effect, Here you are, with a comfortable home, plenty to eat and drink, good Indian clothes to wear, as well treated as any Indian woman, and with everything to make you comfortable and happy. And here you may stay if you choose. On the other hand, if you wish to go to New Amsterdam, 
you would find no one with whom you are acquainted, except those people who rode away and left you on that desolate coast, and who might have come in search of you a long time before if they really had cared anything about you. If you want to live here among friends who have been kind to you and cared for you, you may do so. If you want to go away and live among people who actually deserted you and appear to have forgotten you, well. You could do that too. Penelope reluctantly explained to this good Indian friend, whom she later referred to as her Indian father, that though she sincerely appreciated his saving her life, and though she had a warm feeling for those of the village who treated her with such consideration, she really needed to go back and live with people of her own race and country. She needed to hear her native languages. She needed her church. He was surprised and saddened, and told her so. She bade a tearful farewell to her delightful friends, and departed. With the men who had come for her. Over the next few years, Penelope kept in close touch with the kindly old Delaware, sending him beads, scissors, cloth, bracelets, mirrors, and other trinkets. But she was relieved to return to the Dutch English society of Gravesend. In New Amsterdam, she met Richard Stout, and they were married in 1644. To them were born ten children. She lived to see 510 of her descendants and died at the age of 110. A monument stands to her honor in New England.